so let me delve right into it. Uh, so I've been asked some questions. First one, uh, views of the discipline. Of course, I can only speak for myself. So let me start by asking the rhetorical question, what is marine environmental history then? Because that is the sort of discipline uh, that probably should be able to, to respond to that question. And of course, environmental history uh, is a wider field which deals with planet Earth. And most of environmental historians think of the Earth as green uh, because it's, uh, we, we are situated on land. Uh, we deal with nature, we deal with production, and we deal with perception. That's how the typical environmental hu historian would look at the world, that it's a combination of the, the stuff out there, the uses we make of it, how we turn nature into resources, and how we use our mental capacity uh, to really do that trick for us. Uh, that process is called environing, which is an artificial word, of course. There is no such thing as environing, but it's a very useful concept for really thinking about how we appropriate uh, the globe. However, we deal with the ocean, uh, so we need to have a blue dot, really, uh, all around us. Uh, and what do we do with that? Well, the problem with the ocean is, of course, that we really hardly see what's in it. We don't see what's under it. Uh, we do see what's around the sea, and we see at least some of what is going on on the sea. Uh, but it's really four-dimensional, uh, and that's very hard for the human mind to get to grips with. We also need to look at what's happening in a material uh, context, in a cultural, intellectual context, and in a political context. And by now, it's become so complex uh, that it's really hard to manage all of that. But that's what marine environmental history is all about. And we enter, of course, that one absolute crucial factor called time to the whole thing, which makes it even more complicated because, of course, what are the archives of the ocean? It's fluid, isn't it? Uh, is there anything? And probably uh, for a very long time, most historians were quite content to say, we can't say anything about this because the archives are just not there. Of course, anyone working at the Deutsches Schifffahrts Museum would say that's rubbish, and it is. So let's start from the obvious uh, point, nam namely that the oceans are very important. Two-thirds, well, the statistics can be debated, but by and large, two-thirds of global GDP is generated in regions within 100 kilometers of the coast. So clearly, we need to pay attention. There is something going on there uh, in the interface between land and sea, and certainly we are very attracted uh, to the coast, uh, as most of us live within 60 kilometers of the coastline. Now, that's general, but as humans, of course, there's no end to diversity. And just one indication of that uh, is the uses we make of the fish in the ocean. Some of us love to eat fish. You all in this audience, I've seen the, uh, the requests for dinner tonight. You seem to love fish, uh, which of course is good for your health uh, and very bad for the ocean health. I'm one of the fish eaters, so I should declare my interest as well. But clearly, if we had been in Argentina, perhaps, we would have been more uh, for the first choice on the menu today. So anyway, as humans, we have very different perceptions on, of what's going on in the ocean. Uh, here is Salvador Dalí's uh, work uh, of the tuna fishermen, uh, which is a very, very bloody encounter uh, with marine life. Uh, a totally different uh, view of marine life would be this Japanese cartoon 
uh, which presents the image that we humans are really suffering from the superabundance of whales who are, which are eating all our fish. So if we killed off the whales, there would be more fish for us to have. So that's a very different point of view than anything that would be acceptable in a Western context, uh, but obviously uh, very important to take to heart. And of course, you can go to a Chinese beach, uh, which will be littered with people who appreciate the aesthetics uh, of the seascape. So all sorts of views of the sea, the oceans are attractive and they are super crowded. We humans love the sea and we use the seas in so many uh, ways and we increase the uses of the sea all the time and more and more users are out there. This is the Anthropocene at sea. We are there, we are populating the sea. It's a crowded space, not just because we are on the sea, we are also around the sea, of course, and we are getting too close for comfort, for our own comfort. Obviously, uh, with that extreme case, uh, the projections will be pretty obvious that in just a few decades, this Dutch seascape will really need to change. There needs to be some dramatic changes within most of our lifetimes, most of us uh, here within our lifetimes, drastic political uh, decisions will have to be made in, in that area. And in many other areas, for instance, Shanghai uh, is now calling on Dutch engineers to say, what are we going to do with this enormously populated countryside, which we now know in a few decades will be inundated. Of course, we are inundating the ocean as well. We are populating not just the surface, but also the sea bottom. Uh, enormous, extensive, complicated networks are extended deep into the ocean as we extract oil and gas and other uh, minerals from the seabed. And we are very noisy as well. Human noise, human generated uh, noise from all our engines have really uh, peaked in the last 50 years and quite clearly are changing, for example, the migratory uh, patterns uh, of some of the large animals which depend on sound for their own communication. So the Anthropocene is clearly out there. When was it in the ocean? When was the ocean Anthropocene? Well, some might claim that it was only seven years ago because in 2009 was really the first time that we ate more fish that had been cultured, uh, so aquacultured fish. We ate more fish aquacultured than we ate fish that had been caught as wild life. So that's a very recent and very, very dramatic change in human behavior, one which we don't really understand, uh, partly because it's not been that much research. There's very few histories of aquaculture out there, uh, and it's happened so rapidly in the last 50 years uh, that we simply forgot to uh, keep track. Others might claim, well, it happened long ago, actually. Certainly, way back in the 19th century, because if we look at the total extractions of a big commercial species like herring, uh, we reach the total allowable catch, uh, which is about 300,000 tons for the North Sea, already by 1875, using sailboats, not uh, steam-propelled uh, vessels, so quite pre-industrial uh, fishing technology. So that debate needs to be had for the oceans. Uh, certainly, we are all impacted by the uh, horrible projections for the uh, corals of the sea that within the next few decades, the bleaching uh, will be a mass phenomenon or perhaps even 
what Paul Rich has occurred. So all of this is just a sample of stuff that marine environmental historians are certainly researching. So is there potential for interdisciplinarity? Of course there is, lots and lots, because at the one end, marine scientists are studying an ecosystem, at the other, we human sociologists, historians, etc., archaeologists, try and understand what's driving it from the human end. And we have a common object, the ocean. So that's brought us together in the Oceans Past Initiative, uh, which has now had uh, five international conferences, the next one scheduled for Portugal in May of next year, and I certainly invite all the museum curators of the Deutsche Schifffahrt Museum uh, to attend, because you will be treated to a fantastic suite of global uh, perspectives on, on the ocean and how humans have changed the oceans, uh, so mid-May next year. It's shifting the baselines, uh, it's shifting uh, baselines for ecologists uh, who have really done a historical turn and it's shifting how we perceive of history, it's a sea change of history. But we are dealing with stuff which is largely still unknown. We are dealing with the last frontier on planet Earth, so lots and lots of new uh, things can constantly, constantly uh, be identified. We know now, thanks to historical uh, studies, that these changes are dramatic and we are pushing back into the past uh, human impact. Here's just one example by my colleague uh, Bo Paulsen, who just did the simple calculation of the famous Dutch herring fishery in 1640. It took about 11 or 12,000 men to extract an annual total landing of 50,000 tons of herring, which was phenomenal at the time, and today it takes only eight men, even working on a quota system, uh, to take out 50,000 tons uh, from just using one boat. So clearly the technological innovation, the rapidity and the enormity of the human impact needs to be fully taken on board when we deal with the oceans. We can know much more about this because we have now really come to grips with the fact that there are huge untapped resources which are available for us to study, such as Russian uh, monastic uh, annals like this one, which proved to contain a wealth of material of 400 years of salmon fishery uh, in the northern Russian rivers. It's all been uh, digitized and understood. We have enormous uh, archives of, in this case, the uh, Queen Conch, uh, which has been uh, captured, uh, brought uh, up on, on the islands of the Caribbean, uh, in pre-Columbian times, so archaeologists have worked their way through this and identified the changes in the fishery and the abundance. We have, of course, fishbone archaeology, and we have, of course, the log books which tell, which tell us so much about uh, what used to be out there. We are also really pushing at the edges of what we can know. Uh, clearly, if we want to understand the Anthropocene, we need to understand also the impact of climate. So did climate impact human activities in the ocean? To which degree can we say anything about it? We ask the simple question, uh, is there any change in ocean productivity over time? And does that impact how we have used uh, the oceans? And this is ongoing research at, at my research center. We analyzed the Gulf of Maine uh, in the west and the North Sea in the east, uh, compared the two and realized that we are probably dealing with a phenomenon of inverse relationships so that when things are really productive in the west, they are 
pretty bad in the east of the North Atlantic. And we see that reflected in the reconstructed historical landings uh, which we are now working uh, on. So here's a whole new area of historical research which is fascinating, but it only just opening up. We are moving in that field from asking anecdotal stories about how fishermen engage with the ocean to engaging much more in a scientific way across the boundaries of history and marine science. So how can we communicate uh, all of this insight uh, in the best possible way? Well, certainly not by putting up that image. Of course, when we deal with the Anthropocene, it's so easy to do the scare story. And the ocean is scary. It's a dangerous environment anyway. And what we're doing to it, we have no clue because we don't see it. And therefore, the consequences are enormous when we realize. But we should not paint it as the doom and gloom of 2048, as uh, one colleague did a few years ago, saying that by 2048, at the current trajectory, all commercial fisheries will have become extinct. Of course, he was uh, ridiculed, and for some good reason, because it's, it was, and he did make the caveat, but of course that did not translate in the public uh, reports on, on his finding, which were a simple extrapolation. Uh, we should not go down that route. Of course, there will be mitigating factors, but we can certainly go down the route of using historical evidence to alert people to the, uh, the scale of change. This probably is the most influential uh, collage uh, any marine scientist has ever put together. It's a simple uh, study by Lauren McLenahan, who uh, happened on a uh, Key West, Florida uh, sports fisherman's uh, company, which happened to have kept photographs of each year's trophy catches since the 1950s. So every time people had come back from a cruise uh, and had their picture taken with the trophy catch, uh, this was in the archive. So back in 1957, this up at the top left was what people would boast about. In 2008, that was what people were boasting about. So enough said, uh, perhaps. And you can, of course, do the same whenever uh, you, you uh, try out your luck. Here was I uh, looking at, at a catch in Taiwan, and suddenly I realized that those uh, fishes, which really ought to have this size in order to be a uh, legitimate uh, catch, were no bigger than that tiny woman's foot. The Anthropocene is scary when we deal with the ocean, and we don't tell the story very well. For example, the big Olympic Games in 2008 off the coast of Qingdao in China, uh, of course, happened in a bay which was known for its jellyfish blooms. And why did it? Why does it have the jellyfish bloom? Well, because of overfishing. This is the fishing port of Qingdao in 2008. What happened in 2008 was that the Chinese authorities, of course, kept trawlers out there in the bay, ready to simply trawl away any jellyfish bloom, so that when the yachtsmen were out there, all you would see would be a wonderful blue sea. This is how we can mask the effects of our presence at sea. But at the end of the day, we need to communicate that when we eat, we participate in a global food system which has enormous impacts on not just our health, but also on how we get the stuff on our plate. Sometimes these connections are not very obvious to us, uh, but when we learn about them, we may realize that 
We are eating down a food system. We are changing the ocean. But that insight may as well not just be a sorry story of degradation. It could be a very powerful story of what could be regained because the ocean is a big place. So contrary to the land where we can kill off the last tiger, we can kill off the last elephant. In the ocean, it's well nigh impossible. There will be hiding places. So if we stand back, there will actually be potential for recovery. So marine protected areas certainly are one way forward. If we get public acceptance, that perhaps we need to say save as much as 50% of the world ocean from ourselves. So my take home message, I suppose, is simply that history may, of course, improve our understanding of the past, but it may also pay, play a role in providing baselines for management targets. It can impact how we perceive of the changes in the ecology and indeed of our coastal environments. And we may help empower people in their, cho in their choices as consumers and citizens. It's a blue planet. Thank you. Sorry, uh, any comments or questions or the, of English or the Deutsch? Thank you very much for the very interesting um, presentation and talk. Um, I have a question that I, I have to frame it somehow. Um, yeah, I hope I frame it correctly, basically, to get myself understood. Um, I just a week ago came back from my first research expedition and um, for four weeks we had been out of the, on the ocean, which was new to me. And when we finally got into Cape Verde, I was so enthralled by so much culture around us like every flower garden front garden was an expression of culture suddenly so what i was then or since then <laughs> sort of am thinking about is this aspect of i mean in the ocean the only culture i saw apart of on the ship itself but um were basically negative signs of human interference yeah plastic etc but there is no i mean on land this ability to see beauty and also I mean there are discussions within cultural studies on the ability to feel human love or that human ability to feel love as, as a regulatory basically to our actions. Now in the ocean you already stress the aspect that a lot of the actions or the consequences of our actions we can't actually see or it's very difficult to see them with our own eyes. No? Um, yeah, I'm wondering what, what your perspective is on this aspect of basically nurturing an understanding of the ocean by also nurturing the human ability to, to see a beauty in it and, and basically love as a regulatory. Yeah. It's difficult. Uh, obviously, we, uh, we, we are dealing with stuff that at the end of the day is the ultimate sort of no-go area very few people will ever be able to uh, to really uh, enjoy uh, underwater beauty they will see it on videos uh, they will be told about this they may go to aquaria and and wonder at this at some creatures but uh, at the end of the day it is an alien environment and a hostile environment uh, there's no getting around that, that we as humans die, of course, when we are exposed to the ocean uh, for a long period of time. It's not that we could turn into aquatic uh, animals. So it really raises the, the, the big challenge of how to communicate uh, a sense that you should just allow stuff and life uh, to go on without you ever being able to touch it. 
uh, or enjoy it, really. Just standing back and relishing the fact that you know it's out there. I think the the coral reef story uh, is very powerful uh, because people do see the beauty and they do understand that this is something which would be a terrible, tragic loss, uh, not just to the planet and to the ecosystems, but to us uh, if they disappear. And one of the... Uh, the uh, the things that may alert us even more is the sense that this is quite acute. This it seems to be happening as we speak. Uh, a few years ago, it was a projection. Uh, and this summer, of course, we have had uh, a lot of scare stories that it seems to be happening on a global scale. So yes, we can be alerted to some. Can we be alerted to a species like the orange ruffy? Uh, which lives at 200 plus uh, meters depths, uh, which has a lifespan of 150 years, uh, matures at the age of 40, and unfortunately uh, are very, very tasty, and therefore have been marketed throughout the Western world at enormous uh, high prices uh, and been really coveted uh, by the best chefs around the globe. Uh, because it just makes a delicious meal. Uh, nobody is alerted to anything. They just say, well, it's, it's just another fish, isn't it? Uh, so we need, of course, to develop some sense of uh, alertness. Could we have menus with uh, clear warning signs? Uh, would that be a way forward? Would it be possible to, to impose that, or should we leave it to, uh, to restaurant owners to, to just be able to market themselves that they are very conscious uh, of, of, uh, of what they do and what they put on people's plates. Uh, I think museums certainly have a big role to play here uh, and in trying out what works, what doesn't work in terms of alerting people. What do people respond to and what well, they say, well, at the end of the day, it's just another stupid species and I couldn't care less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I just, um, uh, it's probably a very stu question from a historian. Um, I, I wondered at your, um, um, about your statistics you, you showed us, and I think it's a very good way to alert people. But um, I just wondered, because you didn't really make a difference between like pre-statistical period, mm -hmm. from 1500 to um, 1800, and uh, after statistical period, and I wondered about um, how to alert people. And I think, of course, statistics works, but I think the, the photos you showed us were so powerful because there are persons in it, and you, have, you, have a, you can develop a very personal approach to them. Um, um, and but third aspect, I think it's, uh, it's I, I'm always having in my head the idea that we can use our archival material actually, perhaps together with visitors, in order to find out about quantity, for example, of whales or fish, fishing, because we have a lot of logbooks in the archives. And I just wondered if you had, well, <laughs> what would what, what, what your ideas or caveats on, on that? Yes, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that 15 years ago, historians by and large said that the, prior to 1850, we could not say much uh, about the impact on, on, on the oceans. Uh, that is certainly not true any longer. Uh, there's been a real breakthrough in, uh, in opening up the archives, realizing how much uh, is actually out there, and also a very, very fruitful collaboration between archeologists and historians. There's so much uh, being done now in understanding the changes in human consumption uh, by way of uh, uh, stable isotope analysis. Uh, and the collaboration is becoming very, very powerful. Uh, so if you pick up uh, books more than 10 years ago, uh, 10 years old, 
you're very likely to see a completely outdated picture of, uh, of, the, of ocean history. Uh, things are, are developing really rapidly. That's one of the, to me, the attractions of this field, because contrary to, to most of my historian colleagues, I don't have the sense that I'm walking down the, the paths of many, many colleagues who have been there already and done the same archival studies. This is fresh. There's so much. Uh, and we now know how to deal with it. And we know where to look and, and the potential of, of the information. Part of uh, this is uh, also about a retraining of historians to be alert to ecosystems, to understand what is uh, an ecological indicator what might this be telling us? Uh, and of course, it's also about becoming more rigorous in certainly in quantitative terms uh, of just measuring like with like, which in the past we haven't really done very well. Uh, and it's also about uh, understanding the, the fruitfulness of dealing with the iconographic material and the cartographic material. There's so much. So I think it's, it's, it's a very fresh, but it's also a, a rapidly evolving field. So that's another challenge to a museum, that you will be uh, dealing with stuff contrary to shipping, which is sort of a very well-established field. This is a rapidly uh, de developing field. Uh, so much is, is happening. I think it's exciting, and I think uh, the public will be excited to just realize that you can get so much out of a, a pile of rubbish on the beach. Thanks. Just um, connected to this, you seem, I might have misunderstood, but you seem to make a difference between um, um, ocean history or marine history and the marine environmental history and um, I'm just thinking of works like from John Gillis um, etc they I, I if I understand it correctly I'm a sociologist or so no historian he would rather see himself as a marine histor historian rather than a marine environmental historian I would assume and what I take from some of his and others works is this othering of the ocean as the space out there that we can't access, etc., which is partly there, but partly also not there. Yeah? I mean, uh, in the end, our influences, our chemicals, our noise, etc., etc., influences even the dark, deepest and darkest corners of the mm -hmm. ocean. Yeah? Also, five thousand meter deep, etc. So, I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering what your exact difference there is, and whether you would advise. Um, when you speak of the dynamic field, you're speaking of the marine environmental history, I assume, but not so much the ocean history. Well, it's a broad church. I, th I think if people do interesting work, welcome. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't want to have sharp uh, uh, divides here. Uh, and, and, and it's not necessary. Uh, and I think, actually, the Ocean's Past Initiative, we even have sociologists in, in our midst. Uh, so, yes, if you have a historical interest, if you are interested in change studies, I think it makes sense to use uh, historical data uh, for whatever purpose you, you want to pursue. Uh, and as long as your study is interesting, well, people will listen to you. Uh, so I, I, I wouldn't be hung up about that. Uh, I'm, I'm much more interested in the, um, uh, the absolute necessity of uh, sharing data uh, and becoming more methodologically alert. A lot of rubbish has been written about the oceans simply because people are able to sort of weave into a text some romantic notions or some half-digested uh, uh, eco-theory. Uh, in, in that sense, it's an, it's an unforgiving field uh, because you need to get your ecosystem theory right. You need to understand the marine science in order to, to make a credible uh, contribution to the field. On the other hand, it's, it's not arcane. It's not 
for bidding. It's certainly doable. And I would say historians have been uh, not just welcomed, because we have, but we have also helped change how biologists do marine science. One example of that is the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, ICES, uh, which of course is the big organization of, of marine scientists, which has all claims to, to owning uh, that space, because they not only do the science, but they also are called on by the likes of the European community to advise on fishing quotas and stuff like that. It's a very powerful organization. And they have now said that they have three priorities. The third is to understand the human factor in the change of the sea. That's a really, uh, that's a real breakthrough. And a very, very important component of that is the working group for historical data, uh, which has now been uh, established for the past seven years uh, and is going on has been recognized by ISIS as truly influential because in the past they, as all scientists, would say we can only trust data which is captured from an experiment, highly controlled, we know exactly the, how data has been generated, which of course means that they can only do stuff in a box, box uh, and the, the historical depth will rarely be beyond five or ten years. They understand now that changes in the sea happen at the decadal and at the centennial scale, even at the millennium sometimes. And they need deep history. And suddenly, historical and archaeological data has become completely accepted, which is novel. Uh, and it's one of the first science, sciences to really have made that move, the historical turn. turn but I see it happening in many sciences that there is a return to natural history because people realize that, yeah, you can't just rely on heavily controlled data. And thank you very much again. Uh, as I said before, there will be time at the end to ask more questions.